Hello, and welcome to the State of 911 webinar series. My name is Sarah, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties with the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience. However, due to privacy rights, we have chosen not to display the number or list of attendees to all on the call today. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask a verbal question during the Q&A session. Please make sure you have a phone icon next to your name and use the raise hand icon shown below your name on the participant panel. If you do not have a phone icon, please hang up and redial with the access code, followed by the pound sign and your unique attendee ID, followed by the pound sign. This information is found on the event info tab. You may also go also ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the down arrow at the right side of the toolbar at the top center of your screen. Please click on the Q&A and the panel will open to allow you to type your question and send to all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your moderator for today, Colby Rockfall. Colby, you now have the floor. Hello, and welcome to the State of 911 webinar series being presented by the National 911 Program. My name is Colby Rackball, and I am support for the program. This webinar series was designed to offer 911 stakeholders information about ongoing federal and state 911 and NG 911 projects and provide real experiences and best practices from early adopters about the NG 911 transi transition process currently underway across the country. Each webinar consists of a presentation from a federal level and a state level 911 stakeholder, with each being followed by a 10 minute Q&A session. If there's time remaining at the end of the event, we will open up the floor to all questions. Following the event, a recording of the presentation along with the slides will be posted to the National 911 Program website, www.911.gov. You can also visit this site to find information on past and future events, as well as to learn more about the National 911 Program. We'll begin today's event with a presentation from SEC Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau E911 MG911 Project Manager, Mr. Timothy May, who will present an update on key 911 initiatives. Following a Q&A with Mr. May, Ms. Maria Jakes, Director, State of Maine Emergency Services Communications Bureau, will present on implementing a statewide text and 911 network in Maine. Now I'd like to hand it off to Ms. Lori Flaherty, Coordinator for the National 911 Program. Thanks, Colby. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tim May today. Tim is, as uh, Colby mentioned, the E911 and NG911 Projects Manager uh, within the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the FCC. He's, uh, frankly, one of the smartest guys I know and a tireless advocate for 911. So we're really lucky to have him today. Tim, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lori, for that very kind introduction. And I want to thank all the participants uh, for being online today and for giving me the opportunity to provide you with an overview of the uh, FCC 911 and NG 911 initiatives. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So today I want to focus on four specific areas. I'm going to focus on cybersecurity, 911 transparency and reliability, the IP transition, and efforts to facilitate the nationwide deployment of NG 911. Next slide, please. So the first priority of the FCC, indeed, a primary reason for the creation of the FCC remains to, to ensure that the nation's core communications infrastructure is secure and reliable. The FCC's responsibility to promote public safety and network security is fundamental. Its mandate is codified in the Communications Act. The FCC was established for the purpose of, among other things, promoting the national defense and the safety of life and property. Cybersecurity presents some distinct challenges above and beyond the FCC's traditional security role for communications. The FCC is working with the telecommunications sector to establish ways to evaluate cyber risk uh, inside corporations with business partners and consumers. And the FCC encourages the public safety community and PSAPs to seek out cost-effective ways to protect their facilities and networks from cyber events and educate their personnel on how to both prevent and respond to such events. Now, there are two key efforts I'd like to highlight today. First, in February, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, NIST, released its framework for improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity. NIST framework is an opportunity to make major meaningful strides in cybersecurity. The framework is not a static checklist, but instead provides a flexible, adaptable approach to risk management that companies and organizations of all types and sizes 
across all sectors can apply. The framework's success, though, will rely on proactive risk management, not reactive compliance with a cybersecurity to-do list. So the same flexible approach is now guiding the FCC's approach to cybersecurity. As detailed by Chairman Tom Wheeler in June, the FCC's approach will not be based on a prescriptive regulatory approach. It will instead harness the dynamism of competitive markets to develop solutions. Chairman Wheeler has challenged private sector stakeholders to create a new regulatory paradigm of business-driven cybersecurity risk management. Now, the FCC will follow four principles, preservation of an open internet, a commitment to privacy, a commitment to cross-sector coordination, and continued support for multi-stakeholder approach to global internet governance. Now, the specific efforts will be built on three pillars. First, information sharing and situational awareness. The Commission is examining legal and practical barriers to effective sharing of information about cyber threats and vulnerabilities in the communications sector. Second, the development of cybersecurity risk management and best practices. The FCC is actively engaged with private sector information sharing and analysis organizations and with our federal partners, particularly DHS and the FBI, to increase the efficiency of threat information sharing and improve situational awareness. Importantly, communications providers will need to work with the FCC in setting a long-term course regarding how companies in the sector communicate and manage risk internally with their customers and business partners and with the government. This will require a degree of transparency and assurance to give consumers the protections they need. And third, the FCC will leverage investment in innovation and professional development. Chairman Wheeler has charted the Commission's Technological Advisory Council to explore specific opportunities where R&D activity beyond a single company might result in positive cybersecurity benefit for the entire industry. And the Commission will work with academia and NIST to evaluate the maturation of our nation's cybersecurity workforce. Uh, next slide. So moving on from the overlay of cybersecurity, a second major area of active engagement by the Commission is 911 transparency and reliability. The FCC's historical approach to 911 reliability has been to promote voluntary development and implementation of industry-driven best practices and to measure implementation of best practices through mandatory outage reporting. In December 2013, the Commission adopted a report and order requiring 911 service providers to take reasonable measures in three key areas to provide reliable service as evidenced by an annual certification. Covered 911 service providers must certify compliance with specified best practices or reasonable alternative measures to mitigate the risk of failure in the areas of critical 911 circuit diversity, central office backup power, and diverse network monitoring. This certification approach will allow the FCC to hold service providers accountable for reliable 911 service while offering flexibility and how they design and operate their networks in different parts of the country, including rural areas. Initial certifications are due mid-2015, and full annual certifications will be due every year thereafter. Um, the report was at order also amended existing FCC rules to ensure that public safety answering points receive more timely and specific notification of 911 outages. Um, I'd like to quickly note, uh, it's not on the slide, but on April 9th and 10th of this year, there was an extensive 911 outage uh, centered in Washington State, but it also affected large areas of Oregon, portions of California, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Florida, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Um, press reports and preliminary data submitted to the FCC's network outage reporting system indicated that in Washington alone, well over 4,500 911 calls to PSAP did not get through during a six-hour period beginning just before midnight on April 9th. So given the large area impacted by this outage, the interdependent communications infrastructure spread across multiple states and providers, and the critical importance of dependable and resilient 911 service throughout the United States, uh, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is examining the causes, effects, and implications of the outage and expects to uh, put together a report on that. Um, Washington State is one of the first states to be fully immersed in a transition to NG911, so this outage has immediate impact on NG911 implementations. Um, to ensure that the Commission receives all relevant information to permit a thorough and accurate analysis, um, the Bureau did open a public docket and is collecting information concerning the causes, effects, and implications of the outage. Uh, next slide, please. So the third area of focus for today's webinar is the transition to an all IP environment. The technology transitions order adopted in January establishes a framework to evaluate the transition and calls for tests of real world applications, as well as targeted experiments and cooperative research as part of the path to quote sunset legacy switch service. Underlying the framework though is the preservation of four enduring values that have always informed communications law, public safety, universal service, 
competition, and consumer protection. To protect the enduring values, the Commission set forth certain criteria for experiments. First, they must preserve 911, E911, and NG911 capabilities. Um, must put in place safeguards to ensure public safety functionality in adverse conditions. It must protect essential communication services for safety of life and national security. They must ensure network security. They must ensure adequate backup power. And they must report network outages. And finally, they must continue compliance with the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. The Commission also set forth some presumptions that the experiments will fully comply with unless the participants can demonstrate the rule or regulation is unnecessary in the face of the benefits associated with the transition. So in the public safety context, the Commission presumes that the experiments will maintain current levels of network reliability, that experimenters have a responsibility to support public alerts, will continue to do so, and that public safety telecommunications priority services will be maintained. After reviewing the record, the FCC will adopt budget and criteria for selecting experiments. And then finally, through a second order, we will solicit formal project proposals. We expect to select a small number of projects later in 2014. Um, a quick note, in April, the Commission conducted a workshop on technology transitions and public safety uh, in order to explore the extent to which 911 networks will be affected by the IP transition. I've provided a link to the video of that event, and I encourage you to take the time to, uh, to listen to that. There's uh, a very interesting uh, group of panelists there, and so it's worth your time. Next slide, please. So some of you may be familiar with the Commission's multi-step approach to facilitating nationwide deployment of NG911. So there are five essential areas of focus needed to complete the NG911 transition. First, we need effective location accuracy determination for all NG911 applications. Second, we need enhanced consumer and PSAP capabilities to support delivery and use of multimedia information, voice, text, data, photos, and videos. Third, we need adequate and sustainable funding. Fourth, we need a comprehensive and consistent technical standards to ensure functionality, interoperability, and security of all system elements. And fifth, we need a workable framework for NG911 governance. Today, we have time to focus on the first three efforts. Next slide, please. So, in terms of enhanced location, so the Commission has adopted rules to ensure that emergency responders receive meaningful and accurate location information with wireless 911 callers so they can dispatch help swiftly into the right location. We refer to these rules as the E911 or enhanced 911 requirements, and the rules were effectuated in two steps. In phase one, carriers must provide the PSAP with the telephone number of the calling party and the location of the cell site or base station transmitting the call. In phase two, carriers must provide more precise location information to PSAPs, specifically the latitude and longitude, the XY coordinates of the caller. This information must be accurate to within 50 to 300 meters, depending on the type of location technology used. The Commission first adopted wireless E911 rules in 1996, a time in which cell phones were used outside or in cars. So if you were home, you used your landline. The Commission's rules do not distinguish between indoor and outdoor wireless 911 calls and permit carriers to demonstrate compliance using outdoor measurements only. So this creates a bit of a regulatory gap. By focusing on outdoor measurements, the rules provide no remedy to address poor performance of location technologies indoors. And notably, the current rules also do not require CMRS providers to determine the vertical or the z-axis, as we call it, location information, which may be of critical importance when trying to locate a caller in a large multi-story building. Next slide, please. So why now? Well, more and more Americans are cutting the cord and using only wireless phones for their communications needs, including making 911 calls. There have been significant changes in how consumers use wireless devices since the Commission last made significant changes to its location accuracy rules. We've got more wireless calls, more wireless calls from indoors, and more wireless calls to 911 from indoors. So for example, at the end of 2007, about 16% of American households were wireless only. Uh, during the first half of 2013, that number had increased to about 40%. Um, these numbers come from CTIA. Certain subsets of consumers are also more likely to use only wireless phones, for example, younger Americans. At the end of 2012, the majority of adults aged 18 to 34 live in wireless-only households. The majority of calls to 911 are now from wireless phones, in some cases over 70% in some jurisdictions. So there's a public safety need for action to provide better location information. At the same time, more calls are originating from 
wireless phones indoors, we have received data from state and local public safety entities indicating a decrease in the percentage of calls that include phase two location information. We've also received data suggesting that these E911 location problems are more acute in urban areas where GPS, currently the most common high accuracy technology deployed, might have trouble penetrating inside metal, stone, or concrete structures. Without more accurate indoor information, first responders may not be able to identify the building from which a wireless 911 call originated, much less the caller's location within that building. Next slide. So at the same time the need for indoor location has grown, <clears throat> indoor location technology has evolved. The Commission tasked the Communications Security, Reliability and Interoperability Council, a federal advisory committee, with evaluating the performance and viability of various location technologies to support E911 services for indoor environments. CISRX testbed examined whether indoor location technologies could achieve the location result needed for improved public safety response, so-called actionable location, with dispatchable address within a tight search ring, for the representative environments for wireless devices are expected to be used, in this case specifically urban, uh, dense urban, suburban, and rural morphologies. CISRX testbed included several building types, steel, glass, concrete, and masonry, and different building heights that were representative of these different environments. CISRC tested the indoor location capability of three different technologies. In a March 2013, CISRC issued a report discussing the results of the testbed and rec rec making recommendations about how best to move forward on indoor location accuracy. While CISRC indicated additional development was required to ensure the provision of actionable location, it also concluded that the testbed results showed significant promise. Moreover, the testbed found substantial progress in one of the tested technologies' capability to provide vertical or z-axis location information, providing approximate floor level accuracy in a significant percentage of calls. Next slide. So here's a general overview of the three different uh, location vendors participating in the test bed and their results. Um, as you can see from this table, accuracy results vary by technology and the particular environment. While further improvement is necessary, the test bed results showed that even over a year ago, search rings of 50 meters or less are possible with existing technology in certain environments. Again, the test bed took place over the winter of 2012-2013, but we understand that the vendors participating in the test bed have been in the process of making improvements to their location technologies. In addition, there have been other vendor efforts in different locations to demonstrate the capability to provide indoor location with promising results. Um, the FCC tasked CISRC 4 uh, with making recommendations for a permanent testbed facility and a uh, set of um, parameters, recommended a set of parameters. Uh, that report was approved by the full CISRC at their recent June meeting and can be read at the provided link. The Commission is now evaluate, evaluating those recommendations within the context of the indoor location accuracy pre proceeding. Next slide, please. So in February of this year, the Commission uh, took action and we issued the so-called third further notice of proposed rulemaking. So the third further notice proposes to bridge the gap in the Commission's rules by proposing location accuracy standards for wireless 911 calls originating from indoors, as well as proposed modifications to the existing E911 Phase Two rules to improve the speed and accuracy of location information for wireless 911 calls from all environments. We're in the middle of the comment cycle for this proceeding. Uh, comments were due in May, and reply comments uh, will be due actually due this Friday, July 11th. We got a bit of an extension there um, because of the complexity of some of the issues. Um, next slide, please. So the further notice advances the Commission's core mission of promoting the safety of life and property of the American public, and in doing so, the, no the notice proposes measures to enhance public safety that are also consistent with other important Commission objectives, including promoting competition, facilitating flexibility by taking a technology-neutral approach that doesn't mandate any particular technology to provide location information, and accommodating new newer technologies. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows the near-term proposals for horizontal and vertical indoor location accuracy requirements. So the further notice proposes that wireless carriers must locate 911 callers indoors in both the horizontal and vertical dimensions. With respect to the horizontal location accuracy, the further notice proposes to require carriers to locate 911 callers within 50 meters for 67% of calls within two years of the effective date of final rules in this proceeding, and for 80% of calls within five years. 
for vertical or z-axis location. The further notice proposes to require carriers to locate callers within three meters for 67% of calls within three years of the effective date of final rules in this proceeding, and for 80% of calls within five years. This three-meter requirement would provide PSAPs with approximately floor-level location. Next slide. Um, testing for compliance in an indoor setting poses certain challenges, for example, building access. You can't access and go inside every building that would be practical or feasible. So the further notice proposes to allow CMRS providers to demonstrate compliance with the indoor location requirements through an independently administered testbed. As I previously mentioned, CISRC has now presented the Commission with a set of recommendations um, for that testbed. In general, though, the testbed would enable carriers to test location technologies in a variety of representative building types typical of urban, suburban, and rural environments. A technology that meets the location requirements in the testbed would be presumed to comply with the Commission's rules without the need for indoor testing in all locations where the technology is actually deployed. The further notice proposes a mechanism through which PSAPs can seek enfor enforcement of the Commission's e rules. But in order to take advantage of this, the notice proposes that PSAPs must have implemented policies that are designed to obtain all the location information the carrier has made available to them through the carrier's Location Information Center. Next slide, please. Um, the further notice highlights that the Commission's long-term goal is to provide PSAPs with dispatchable location information for indoor 911 calls. That is information that not only identifies the building, but also the floor level and room, office, or apartment from which the call originated. The further notice seeks comment on whether carriers can leverage in-building technology, such as small cells or distributed antenna systems, to provide this more granular location information. The notice also seeks comment on how commercial location-based services, emerging technologies, and other information sources could be used to pinpoint a caller's in-building location. Next slide, please. Finally, in addition to proposals focused on indoor location, the further notice also seeks comment on proposals to improve the accuracy and timeliness of location information for all wireless 911 calls. I'm not going to go through this entire list, but I do want to focus on two of them. Um, to ensure that location information is delivered swiftly, the notice asks whether we should establish a maximum time period for the so-called time-to-first fix in a wireless 911 call. In other words, carriers must deliver the location information within the specified degree of accuracy within a maximum period period of 30 seconds. The notice also seeks comment on whether we should modify our existing phase two requirements for outdoor calls based on advancements in technology and the widespread deployment of HGPS technology that allows for more granular location. So the Commission's focused on making sure you can reach 911 and get help effectively, whether you're whether you place a call from your wireless phone indoors or outside, and we're focused on ensuring that the Commission's rules evolve as technology evolves and as consumer habits and reasonable expectations change over time. Next slide. Um, moving to the second component of our NG911 discussion, one of the benefits of NG911 is that it offers the promise of supporting a wider range of access to critical emergency services. You know, one of the first interim steps on the road to full NG911 is text 911. By some estimates, several trillion text messages are sent each year both via traditional SMS and other text messaging applications. While voice calling remains the preferred means to reach 911, text to 911 is an important complement where a voice call is not an option. It's a valuable tool for those who are deaf, hard of hearing, or who have speech disabilities, and it can be a lifeline for those who cannot make a voice call because it would place them in danger or because of network congestion. To make texting a viable alternative for reaching emergency services, the four major wireless carriers, alongside APCO and NINA, the National Emergency Number Association, signed an agreement in December 2012 in which they committed to making text to 911 service available to requesting PSAPs by May 15th of this year. The four carriers met their commitment and have achieved nationwide readiness to deliver text to text-capable PSAPs. Another key milestone uh, was the development and release in 2013 of the ADIS TIA SMS to 911 standard to provide technical specifications for wireless carriers uh, to use their SMS platforms to route and deliver text to PSAPs. Next slide, please. Um, the Commission's efforts with Text 911 began in earnest in December 2012 when it adopted a further notice of proposed rulemaking that coincided with the major carrier's voluntary commitment to implement texts. The further notice teed up a number of proposals that would apply to any provider of text messaging services widely available to the public. As an initial action, though, the Commission adopted a report and order just over a year ago to ensure that consumers attempting to send text to 911 in areas where text was not supported by a PSAP received a so-called bounce-back message 
message from their covered text provider. Uh, on, the on the slide, you can see what that text is. Um, a September 2013 order clarified the requirements for wireless carriers related to the routing and delivery of text for consumers roaming on their networks. And then in January of this year, the Commission adopted a policy statement and a second further notice of proposed rulemaking addressing a host of issues related to text 911. Next slide. So the policy statement outlines the Commission's belief that Every commercial mobile radio service provider and every provider that enables a consumer to send text messages using numbers from the North American Number Plan should support text 911 capabilities. To encourage this development, the Commission stated in the, that its in, it intention to pursue a technologically neutral approach that builds on consensus proposals from stakeholders in industry and the public safety community. And the policy statement also expressed the expectation that the major carriers would meet their commitment to be text 911 ready throughout their networks by May 15th, and indeed each did meet that commitment. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, along with the policy statement, the Commission also adopted a second further notice of proposed rulemaking, proposing that text 911 service should be implemented by all covered text providers no later than December 31st of this year and be available within a reasonable time after a PSAP request service, but not to exceed six months. Oh, sorry, next slide. Thank you. Um, the notice also sought comment on a range of issues, including the application of text 911 rules to so-called over-the-top text messaging providers and the challenges they face in implementing text 911. There are also a number of roaming and routing issues, as well as location accuracy for text that we're examining. Um, the comment and reply comment record closed on May 5th, and we're currently reviewing the record. Next slide, please. So where do we stand today with text 911 deployments? Uh, we've seen a steady increase in the number of jurisdictions adopting text 911 and taking advantage of the readiness of the four major carriers to deliver text. As of our counting on June 30th, approximately 17 states have PSAPs accepting text 911. Some states, such as Vermont and Maine, who you will actually hear from today, are accepting text on a statewide basis from the four major carriers. Others, such as Indiana, where over 36 counties are accepting text, are aggressively rolling out the capability across all of their counties and PSAPs. Nationwide, a total of 110 counties are text capable and approximately 102 PSAPs are accepting text. Um, that map on the slide was uh, put together by Mark Fletcher at Avaya, so I want to thank him for that. Um, a number of states and jurisdiction, jurisdictions have issued requests for proposals for text 911 platforms, um, such as Massachusetts and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. So the march continues. Uh, I just saw this morning that some additional counties in Texas um, have launched the service, I think with Verizon and, and T-Mobile. So so I will have to update our table. Um, now, PSAPs have several methods by which they can receive text. And at present, the web browser is the most popular, followed by direct IP connection. And there are approximately 11 PSAPs uh, utilizing their existing TTY capability to manage texts. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned earlier, the FCC may assign certain tasks to the CISRIC for deeper examination and to make a set of consensus-based recommendations. And in June, the full CISRIC voted and approved two such reports related to Text 911. Uh, the first report concerned PSAP request for service for Text 911. The report recommends best practices that wireless carriers, PSAPs, and 30-party service providers should follow in provisioning PSAP requests for text 911 service. Um, best practices include testing and trialing, operational procedures, and security requirements. The second report was an investigation into location improvements for text 911. The approved report assesses the technical feasibility for wireless carriers to include E911 phase two location accuracy and information in text sent to 911 and makes recommendations for including enhanced location information in text 911. Um, both reports are available at the link provided on the slide. Uh, next slide, please. And then a third key area for facilitating nationwide deployment of NG911 is funding. The Net911 Act requires that the Commission um, report to Congress annually on how states and other jurisdictions collect and spend 911 fee revenues, including instances of revenue diversion. The Commission has now issued five such annual reports, the most recent in December 2013, reflecting fees and expenditures during calendar year 2012. In addition to ensuring we receive a clear accounting of the collection and use of 911 and E911 fees, the Commission has been tracking expenditures on NG911 systems. 
As reported in the fifth report, 44 respondents indicated that their 911 funding mechanism allows for the distribution of 911 funds for NG911 implementation. Of the states that indicated that their funding mechanism allows for this, 24 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, indicated that they use 911 funds for NG911 programs in 2012. Um, the collection of state data is underway for our sixth annual report, and we expect to submit that report to Congress by the end of the year as required by statute. Lastly, with respect to funding, I encourage you to review the report and recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Panel convened by the National 911 Program. It provides an excellent survey of current funding and financing strategies, as well as funding governance models, the challenges that those models face, and the limitations and opportunities afforded by other types of funding methods. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, the Commission's focused on a number of areas. Today I highlighted its efforts to ensure that current networks are secure and reliable and describe the approach it will take to ensuring cybersecurity. Second, the Commission's focused on protecting access to and maintaining oversight of end-to-end -end emergency communications networks for consumers and public safety during and after the transition from TDM-based networks to IP-based IP networks. And lastly, in order to facilitate the deployment of next-generation 911 systems, the Commission's focused on enhancing location accuracy, implementing text 911, and tracking the collection and use of 911 fees, and identifying sustainable funding mechanisms for NG911. I'd like to thank the National 911 Program and Lori Flaherty for the opportunity to provide you with this overview today. I'd also like to thank uh, Kobe Rockfall and Andrea Kiernan for their assistance uh, facilitating the presentation, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you so much, Mr. May. Um, we're actually going to defer questions, but if you do have any, please post them to the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to get them to Mr. May. Um, and Ms. Lori Flaherty will now introduce Ms. Maria Jakes, Director, State of Maine Emergency Services Communications Bureau. Thanks, Colby. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Maria. She's an experienced uh, 911 State Director, uh, and I think one of the things that really distinguishes Maine and Maria's uh, statewide system is their willingness to consider new ideas, to take on new challenges, and to work with multiple new partners. Um, great segue from the FCC presentation to this one. Maria will be talking about their experience in Maine in terms of implementing text to 911. So Maria, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for asking me to uh, present on this webinar today. It's a great honor to be asked to share our experience. So today I'm going to talk about Maine's uh, SMS to 911 journey, um, and specifically I'll give you a little bit about Maine's 911 system, why we chose to be an early adopter, how we selected the interface we did, our getting ready process, um, PSAP training, our experience going live in public education strategy, our operational experience, and then what we see as our next steps. Hopefully after that we'll have time for a few questions. So Maine has been a statewide 911 um, system since 2001. We never really had a um, 911 until that point, and so our PSAPs operate on one network, one database. Uh, they can transfer calls because uh, they're all connected to the same two tandems um, between each other. So we are truly a statewide 911 system. I have a it's run by my staff. We are a staff of nine, and we have a 17-member advisory council. And I bring that up only because one of those members, our deaf and hard of hearing representative, played a major role in our journey. We have 26 PSAPs for our state-run uh, PSAPs. They kind of act as the default uh, routes for all the different PSAPs, 13 county and nine municipal regional uh, centers. Uh, we have nearly a thousand political subdivisions in Maine made up of 500 municipalities in nearly 500 unorganized townships. We are currently in the final month of an NG911 uh, deployment. And with that, that's a whole other separate discussion, but that's a, a total forklift of the whole system. So all the PSAPs will be our NG911 deployment and, and as well as the network, NG911 capable. So why SMS to TTY? 
Our story begins back in July of 2010 when our deaf advisory, a uh, deaf uh, representative met with the governor and his staff about his inability to access 911. Uh, the governor's office reached out to us for a response, and we gave probably what you have given as a response. There's really no clear solution for text to 911. It won't be available until, until NG911, and we promised that we were working hard to get there. Uh, we felt we complied with the requirements of the ADA law. Another year went by, and we met with this council rep and other uh, representatives of the deaf community, community on this very same issue. And they explained to us that there were approximately 26,000 people with hearing disabilities living in Maine, that's according to the U.S. Census Bureau, and that the deaf community was quickly abandoning the use of TTY for text, although text between uh, has really opened up the world to them to be able to communicate with those that can't hear. They couldn't connect with the emergency services, and that um, was a major um, problem for them. Waiting for NG911 implementation wasn't a good enough answer. I don't know about you, but when I call, and I have an emergency, I want my call answered in less than a minute, never mind. Uh, let's wait for NG911 deployment. It started to give, I really left that feeling, uh, that meeting feeling like we had, were taking a major step backward and failing, uh, failing a constituency of ours. Uh, because I remember back in the early days, I've been with the program since we started, um, and we had a meeting for the the peace ops we were going to activate with Enhanced 911, and we invited a gentleman from the Maine Center on Deafness, and he told the story about how when he was growing up with hearing parents, they, they placed a recorder by his phone with a, a tape tape recorder, so that if he had an emergency, he was to dial the seven-digit emergency number. We had no 911 back then, and play the recording that he was deaf and he couldn't to speak and he needed help. And I thought, well, basically, this is what we've almost asked these people to do again, to rely on relay services and all the other to, to get to us again. And, um, you know, my supervisor, Commissioner Welsh, and I felt we really needed to pursue this more aggressively. So we were actively following the industry and the FCC as it struggled to find an interim solution. And we're thrilled to hear uh, of the announcement of you know, the voluntary agreement. And then in June 2012, when we attended NIA conference, we heard Verizon was ready for some trials, and I quickly volunteered uh, to participate. So then um, the selection of the interface to us, uh, there are basically three ways you can do it. You can select you can, as Tim went over this, so just quickly, you can connect via IP, the I3 protocol, or you can use an internet browser that's used, it's separate, uh, on a separate system from the 911 equipment, doesn't come in through your 911 CPE, or you can use the TTY gateway and connect to the E911 system on your the same trunks that you connect to your piece app with, and have your text message come in through your TTY interface. For us, that was the, the what we decided to do. Um, the SMS to TTY solution. We felt the ability to have all calls in, including text, in legacy E911 CPE that that was capable of logging and recording the event. So just like our TTY call. Uh, we would see the text of that conversation in our MIS system, and it was recorded. Our TTY, our uh, text conversations would also be recorded. It, it required no CPE modification. So even though we were in the midst of a RFP and a, an NG911 deployment, we were able to go ahead with text to 911 and meet this consumer need. So literally, the only two things we did to our CPE was turn off the auto answer. So you might be familiar with this. When you, you get a TTY call, your mo most systems, the TTY window pops up and an automated message goes off, out. You know, uh, you've reached 911 with the address of your emergency. We have, 
had to shut that off because when you think about how text messaging works, you the the texter speaks first, not the not the person you're communicating with. Um, so it was writing over their conversation, their first um, message, and then we also had to do some uh, audio uh, adjustments on the CPE. And the other reason we uh, chose it is as the state 911 program, we support all the CPE, but we don't support anything else in the P PSAP. So this interface, this internet connection wouldn't be ours. Any kind of computer equipment that the, uh, if we use, this, use the browser method wouldn't be under our responsibility. And there would be actually no additional costs. So what did we do to get ready? Because this was, we were in this, together in this problem with the Department of Public Safety, uh, they selected, along with us, we helped uh, with our suggestions, two of their four centers to serve the whole state. And if you look at the state of the main map, the area in the southern portion where the outline is for DPS gray is half the population of the state, and the rest of the air, land area represents the other half. So um, those two PSAPs were selected to answer text messages for the entire area. They're familiar because of our statewide system and the fact that they serve as alternate and default routes already. They're very familiar with doing this, you know, providing information to uh, other PSAPs when the calls get delivered to them incorrectly. So this was fine, you know, an easy transition for them. Next slide, please. So as far as PSAP training, we simply developed a PowerPoint explaining the features of the service, uh, comparing it to how, it, pointing out any differences that in um, how it worked in comparison to TTY, how to recognize the text call. We also went into the limitations of location information and described what course location was. It's similar to a phase one location, so they couldn't depend on that for uh, the location of the caller. We explained the inability to call back or transfer the caller. Um, and that it was limited to Verizon Wireless. No roamers, no uninitialized phones, and only in Maine. So it was a pretty easy tr transition, as I discussed, because it was is handled within the TTY interface. We encouraged them to train. We gave them test phones if they didn't have Verizon Wireless uh, phones in their centers to be able to test, um, you know, in, in their spare time. And when we added um, a second carrier, and I'll get to that later, it required no additional training. We also notified the other PSAPs in our system of what to expect so they'd understand that they weren't going to get a text message um, directly, that they would have the information relayed to them. This is actually one of the training slides right here, what our Annie Alley display uh, looks like. Um, the black mark in the middle is the callback number. You'll notice that it does not pr provide the address of the tower. It actually provides the um, shell record, but our mapping system did map uh, the course location. And uh, what else is, it also identifies it as a text message in the selective transfer information. Next slide, please. So a public education strategy uh, with Verizon Wireless, uh, they wanted to do a joint press release with uh, TCS, Verizon Wireless, and ourselves. It generated several different uh, television stories. We placed articles in newsletters serving the deaf and the hard of hearing. But we generally kept it pretty low because it only involved one carrier. The good news is if other people tried it on other phones, um, other carriers, then they would get the bounce back message. And we did test that with all our other carriers. Uh, there are five in Maine, uh, and they all were providing bounce back messages as of 
well, when we launched in May of 2013. Next. So, uh, as I said, uh, we were Verizon Wireless's first office application for their SMS to TTY. We went live in May 2013. We really have had very few text calls. We had a flurry when we announced its availability. Um, but really, no noticeable impact on call taking. And it's been easy to use. Uh, we have had the one standout emergency we had was of a domestic violence situation where a child called um, a text, texted um, an emergency involving their parents, his parents or her parents, I'm not sure which. Then in Sprint, uh, we went live in June 2014 with a different text control center. Again, that implementation went very well, very smoothly. They present the caller, the text message slightly different. With Verizon Wireless, we, we, the start of the message is always SMS colon, so we know it's a text message versus TTY even without looking at the, the alley screen. And uh, Verizon Wireless um, has a streaming message until you actually answer the text message of the SMS um, caller, SMS caller, something to that effect. So Sprint does it a little different, but still, it, even the little bit of difference between the two carriers it was easy for the PSAP to adapt to. So what did so in the end, you know, even though we had a next-gen system soon on the horizon, what we did w prove was that it can work on your legacy, you know, on equipment. There's no need to wait. Um, this is an important service. Uh, there are two. We we also proved that two PSAPs serving the state. Um, did not overwhelm them, that texting wasn't going to be this. Everybody feared that people would abandon voice calls for text. That has not played out at all. And we also proved that when we transitioned to a different CPE vendor, even though it was on the NG91 network, it went smoothly. There were no problems. Uh, so this wasn't just a one-off uh, situation. Next slide. What's our next steps? Well, uh, we will complete our NG91 implementation next month, and then we see our next step as to move to an IPI3 connection, which will give us a lot more flexibility on how that call handling management, ex expanded out to other PSAPs, and give them the ability to transfer a text between them. With a course location in 26 PSAPs, uh, you're obviously going to get out of area text messages. We hope to complete um, text deployment with the other carriers and continue public outreach. Next slide, please. Okay, so just in concluding, I would just say that, you know, it was probably one of the most rewarding projects I've ever been involved in. The gratitude from the um, the deaf and hard and care, deaf and hard of hearing community was was amazing, but that's not. We just knew that we had done the right thing for them, and you know when I started thinking about, it, I had two college age students, and how would I have felt if I was in the Virginia Tech situation with them? This is an important service. It's not a nice to have thing. This is a must have situation, and I would encourage you all to take it on. And with that, I'll open up the questions. Okay, so at this time, um, we will do our verbal Q&A session. Just a reminder to all attendees, if you'd like to ask a verbal question, we will open up your line. All we ask is that you use the raise hand feature below your name in the participant panel. That'll put you in the queue to ask questions. So we'll just give it a couple of minutes and see if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask verbally.
Sarah, we have two um, questions from the Q&A box. Um, so Maria, um, who is monitoring to make sure w, WSP are providing timely delivery of text to 911 and that users are not getting delays under normal use or heavy traffic events? For text to 911? I don't know that who is monitoring that. We don't have the capability to monitor that um, from our end. I don't know if the carriers are. Okay. Um, and the next question is, um, could you elaborate a little on I3? Well, that would, uh, <laughs> it's a little I know. It would be a native SIP. Uh, message uh, directly to our NG911 network, which my understanding is is that once we get within our own I3 network, then we would be able to transfer the call between the PSAPs. So that would be an ideal situation. So what we hope to do is uh, work with the carriers um, that we've deployed with in any future to uh, you know, expand this to I3. Great. Um, our next question is, what was the funding strategy for SMS, and what will be the future funding strategy for IP? We had no f costs to our deployment because we already had it, – it came, you know, in on our native um, – you know, our, our current CPE with no modification, so we didn't need any. Um, with NG911, um, again, not sure. We haven't gotten there what the, the cost will be, but our PSAPs are all I3 capable, uh, NG911 compliant, and um, so is our network, so we'll cross that bridge. But our funding is largely surcharge, 911 surcharge, and we collect that at the state level. Our current surcharge is $0.45, cents, um, and it covers wireline, wireless, prepaid, and postpaid through point, um, and um, VoIP service. Um, and our next question is, when one of the text PSAPs receives a call that needs to be handled or dispatched by another PSAP, does the text, take, the text taker stay in the middle between the text originator and the other PSAP? Uh, we do not conference in the other PSAP. We just relay the information. So the tech, the PSAP that is handling the call stays in contact with the texter, but they pick up a line or somebody else does and calls the other PSAP and tells them the nature of the emergency and where it's located. So they are not connected in a conference. That's a limitation. We cannot the TTY the TTY to SMS methodology does not allow for a transfer. Okay, and that's our last question from the Q and A chat. Does anyone have any verbal questions they'd like to ask? You know, one other I just want to one other thing I didn't talk about, but there's two you know challenges with text to 911. Uh, EMD, we require it at the statewide level. This hasn't been an issue so far, but it would be cumbersome to do um, via text. And then should we get a text message in a foreign language? Although we provide language line for voice folks, that service, you know, without, isn't, we, with the TTY at least solution. There's no way to conference in a foreign language service. So that could be a challenge. So we haven't had those experiences, but it could be a challenge. Still better than not offering it just because of that known limitation. And we have another question. Did you experience any frustration from residents about the service only being available initially to Verizon customers? No. People are excited to know when it might be available to them. Um, but no, they're just pleased that we are moving along and taking steps to address the issue. Okay. 
Um, we have another question. Um, is there any expectation of the 911 provider to know um, when they are not going to receive 911 calls because a telecom provider network is out, which causes a notification for a notification gap for PSAP? Is that a question for me? When, I don't even want to read that one again. Um, it's, yeah, Tim's on the line. Um, I, yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Um, yeah, again, it's a bit out of context, and I'm not sure I understand the, the totality of the question. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, but I'm happy to take the call a call directly and and chat about it. Um, you know, it sounds like a scenario t based type of thing, and I'm not going to make it on the fly interpretation unless I know a little bit more. Great. Um, are there any other questions? Great. If there's no other questions, I'd really like to thank uh, Ms. Jakes and thanks again to Mr. May, and thank you all for attending today's presentation. We look forward to your participation in future State of 911 webinars. The next webinar will be Wednesday, September 10th at noon Eastern with presentations from Mr. Jim Marshall from the 911 Training Institute and Mr. David Hull from the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. Registration for this event will open up in early August. Again, for more information on the National 911 Program or to view a recording of this or past events, please visit our website at www.911.gov. Thanks again. Thank you all.